Welcome to Trinity Radio. I'm so glad you're here. I'm Braxton Hunter, and today we're going to be taking a look at a debate between Frank Turek and Michael Shermer. I've never covered Frank Turek on this uh, program before, so I'm really excited about that. Um, I, I've met Frank Turek on a couple of occasions, and um, uh, I think he is a skilled debater, and so this should be interesting. I've covered Shermer a little bit, but today we're going to be taking a look really at um, a brief section from the debate during the cross-examination period where some things came up that I think illustrate that atheists just kind of have to pretend about certain things, certain things that their worldview really doesn't allow for, uh, but that they really need for life to be meaningful. And then so as a result, it's kind of like, well, even though that's not exactly real, at least in the way that most people think that it is, or the way that really matters and makes humanity meaningful, we're going to just pretend about it. And in this way, I think it results in something that we could call Stepford atheism. Um, many of you are familiar with The Stepford Wives, which was a book, and then a 1970s film, and then they remade it in 2004 with Nicole Kidman and Christopher Walken and some others. And what happens in The Stepford Wives, if you're not familiar, is that um, there, is a, there is a society of, of individuals. This is a horror film, by the way. There's a, there's a community of individuals, and the wives in that um, community are uh, either robots or... Uh, some sort of a chip has been implanted, depending on the, I think, depending on the iteration of whether you saw the book or read the book or saw the films or which film you saw. But something has been done to alter these women so that basically they are the quintessential 1950s, um, at the time, thought to be idyllic wife. That's that's basically what. They, and so there was no complaining, no problems. All they want to do is please their man. Sex. They don't ever question him. They're not smarter than him or more accomplished than him. So so very much like a 1950s uh, sort of a stereotype of what a man wants in a woman. And ultimately, you find out though that's because these women who would have otherwise been normal women and perhaps even more successful than than the typical woman. Uh, they've had this chip implanted or whatever that makes them this this sort of a character. And then uh, but then ultimately, at least in the 2004 film, which is what I've seen in the end of the film, you find out that, oh, wait, actually, the husbands are <laughs> also Stepford husbands. And so uh, the, the things that that are most meaningful about being a human being have been stripped away by one or the other gender, uh, depending on where in the movie you're at, uh, to try and create some sort of an ideal and then pretend the goal is to pretend. See, in the Stepford community, you want the Stepford wives uh, let's say the husband wants the Stepford wife to in every way seem to be free, seem to be a moral agent, seem to be reasoning and ration and using rationality properly. All of these things, th th there needs to be an element of pretense here. We want to pretend that that's going on. We just want we know it's we we know that under the hood it's not really going on. We just want it to be um, the as close of an approximation to what we want, still seeming as though all those things that make for a meaningful existence or a meaningful wife are all still there. So uh, here are my thoughts on this as we enter this discussion because I think you're going to find that if atheism if if the well let's say this if the position that God does not exist were true. And I realize that atheists, many of them define themselves as just lacking the belief. But but if the position that God does not exist turned out to be true, then I think what we would find is most of the most meaningful things that we care most about as human beings are stripped away and we're left pretending. And so we're left with a Stepford style atheism. So what is Stepford atheism? Well, with real wives, there are a lot of great things that you love about them and enjoy. They provide real love, real companionship, a real opportunity for you to give of yourself for the good of another selflessly. That's good for you. That's that sacrifice. Um, so they allow you to grow as a person like that. But there are a lot of things that um, the stereotypical 1950s man, let's say, might not like. Real wives come with responsibility. They expect things from you. They don't always see it your way. They can be demanding, and they are not okay with your being unfaithful. But with Stepford wives, those things you don't like are gone. Unfortunately, so is the real love, the real freedom, the real reasoning on the part of that wife. The meaning has been stripped from them, and with it, what makes romance, uh, romance worth it to begin with? Likewise, with God, there are a lot of things, really great things, that everyone would love and enjoy about God. He provides real love, real companionship, real purpose, and an opportunity for real sacrifice to give of yourself for the good of another in an act of worship. 
But there are a lot of things that some people don't like. God comes with responsibility, just like a real wife. He expects things from you. He doesn't always see it your way. He can be demanding, and he is not okay with your being unfaithful. With atheistic naturalism, like with Stepford Wives, those things you don't like are gone. Unfortunately, so is real love, real freedom, real reasoning, real morality. All of those things are gone. The meaning has been stripped from reality and with it what makes life worth it to begin with. And like the Stepford husbands, spoiler alert, you come to find out it's not just that others have no real freedom, rationality, morality, and so forth. You are likewise a moist robot carrying out a pretense, carrying out a pretend existence. It's all make-believe, these things that you say you like about humanity. To be a thoroughgoing atheist is to be a true citizen of Stepford, hence the Stepford Atheist. Now, let's take a look at this discussion between uh, Frank Turek and uh, Michael Shermer, and let's just see if that actually bears out and and show you why I think this is fair. So we're going to begin with rationality, because, of course, Frank Turek wants to make the case. Well, I'll let him make the case himself because he does such a good job in this debate. So here we go. Uh, Michael, question I'll put on the board so everyone can see. If your brain evolved by an unguided, unintelligent process and all your thoughts are completely dictated by the laws of physics, in other words, you're a moist robot, then why should we think your thoughts are true, including the thoughts you've stated right here tonight? Okay. Um, we're operating at different levels here. So you're t- you, you, it, it would be like if you wanted to explain water by looking at the quantum physics uh, in the subatomic particles in hydrogen and oxygen atoms. How do you get water out of these quantum, these, these um, quarks inside the uh, protons and neutrons of the atom. Y- you don't. It's a higher level explanation. Uh, 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 much like we talk about emergent properties. How do you get democracy out of atoms? Well, you don't. You don't use physics to explain democracy. You use political science. So we're, what we're talking about here is kind of different levels, explanatory levels. Uh, which is one reason why we have different fields of study to, uh, you know, think about the cause of things and economics or psychology or, or whatever. So, well, I, I agree with you on that, that there are other fields of study. But if you're a materialist, unless you've changed your mind, all that exists are molecules. So, again, no, well, not, why should we all. believe what so, you're saying? So consciousness, well, that, 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 that's sort of a bizarre question. What, what do you mean why you should believe it? It, it, it would be like saying... You're made out of quarks, and, and, and so why should I believe you? What does what, what quarks or atoms got to do with anything? We're because if, about if, ideas. If, if we're controlled by the laws of physics, including our thoughts, why should we expect our thoughts to be true? Okay. Yeah, so this is uh, well put by um, Frank Turek, I think. And the idea here is, and, and this, is, this is related to free will, but it's its own thing as well. If everything is just, well, there's a couple of ways you could go with this. Um, you could take Alvin Planting as sort of um, argument that um, evolution, um, if, we, if we presume evolution, it is geared towards survival, but not necessarily for truth. And we recognize that. And so um, if, evolution, if, if you understand evolution, then the reality is you shouldn't trust that your brain is going to um, be, be set up to help you get to truth. It's just, helped, it's just to get you to survival. And so you can't, you don't have, you can't make justifiable knowledge claims there either. The idea is you may be right about certain things, but you can't be justified in claiming that you're right because the uh, tool, the utensil, your, your reasoning, the process that you're using to arrive at truth statements is, has been undercut because it's not, it's not set up to get you to truth. It's set up to get you to survival. Another way you could look at it is, look, if this is all just molecules in motion, and this does get into the free will thing a little bit, but if it's all just molecules in motion, then whatever you end up believing is just what you were determined to believe and you could not have believed otherwise. This is difficult for some people to get their minds around, but it's the truth. If, if a man, uh, like let's take two scientists who are observing the same data, the same experiment, and uh, they're, they're looking at all of this and they they'd come to a conclusion about what the experiment means, what the results of the experiment mean. And, and they come to two slightly different conclusions. Well, why did they come to two slightly different conclusions? 
Well, because this one thought about it this way and that one thought about it that way. Okay, ultimately, whatever they concluded, and even if they hadn't concluded something about that experiment, but one of them concluded that the experiment must mean something crazy, like that pink unicorns are dancing on the rings of Saturn. They only believe whatever they believe because they were determined to believe it and they could not have believed otherwise. Now, a typical response to this is, well, but that's the very thing. Of course, our, our reasoning process, we don't have any choice. We can't use rationality in the sense of weighing out different options and then freely in a free will sort of way choosing which thing we should affirm. We're stuck affirming whatever determinism tells us we should affirm. But we can still get to the truth because we can run experiments and then we can learn. We can verify this. We can ask other people. But understand when you ask other people, when you run experiments, you're rely you're still relying on the same reasoning process, whether that person is telling you the truth, whether you should listen to them that has been undercut by the whole thing to begin with. And so are they because they're running on determinism as well. The reason this is a problem, again, if you're new to the show, is because um, if we are not free, it's not just that our actions are not free, but if free will does not exist, if determinism is true, if naturalism is true, then it means that not just your actions, but even your thoughts and beliefs are determined and could not have been otherwise. You could not have believed otherwise. And what this means is you don't have any way to, you don't have, you can't make justified knowledge claims. You might end up being right about some things and wrong about other things, but, but you can't claim that you know that you're right. You can't, you can't have justified knowledge claims because um, you realize that whatever you ended up believing was just what you were determined to believe. And on atheism, you have naturalism and you have determinism more than likely. And so as a result, you can, you, rationality goes out the window. Now, some people actually recognize this, but before we get to those quotes, let's see what he says about free will because this is all wrapped up together. So here's Shermer on free will. I'm a compatibilist, so I believe that we have volition and free will. How? Uh, well, okay, so um, it, it has to do with emergent property of complex systems. So you and I have more degrees of freedom than a dog. Dog has more degrees of freedom. What, by degrees of freedom, I mean places to move, choices to make. So you know, rats make choices. I'll press the left bar, the right bar, I'll go down this alley, that alley, whatever. Those are choices. Rats make them, dogs make them, we make them, uh, and, and we have more choices, more degrees of freedom than, say, rats, than, say, cockroaches. Okay, so, like, what would be the difference between a drug addict uh, hooked on OxyContin and you and I who are not? You know, you and I don't, are, are not under that sway, but this, this, the poor addict is. There's a difference there of degrees of freedom, okay? So I, I, would, I would answer it that way, that it, it, it's, 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 it's kind of different levels of how many controlling vectors are at work. Yeah, okay, so you see there, what, what he's saying is, I'm a compatibilist. So he brought free will into it. He says, no, 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 I, I'm a compatibilist. He recognizes that you need free will in order to have rationality and justified knowledge claims. Otherwise, you're just stuck believing whatever the universe determined that you would believe impersonally. And so, um, so he says, yeah, but, but I do believe in free will. I'm a compatibilist. Now, a compatibilist, as many of you know, is a determinist who recognizes that whatever you end up believing is what you were determined to believe. But, you, but compatibilism says not that free will in, in the strong sense of what we call libertarian freedom, what I hold to, uh, probably what most people hold to, that whatever you ended up doing, you didn't have to do that. You could have done something else. You were free in that sense. Compatibilism doesn't say that's compatible with determinism, but it says that determinism is compatible with the language of free will, and perhaps we can hold people morally responsible. So you're free to do whatever you want to do. So what more do you want than the freedom to do whatever you want? But you're not free to want whatever you want. Your wants are determined. And then, of course, whatever you do is determined by those wants. So it's just really a trick of the tongue to be able to use the language of free will, even though what you're really talking about is determinism. And um, he wrote the uh, introduction, Michael Shermer wrote the introduction to uh, Dan Barker's book on free will, in which the, the point of the book is to say that free will is an illusion. So what is an illusion? An illusion is something that's not real, but it seems to be real. And of course, Barker's position is that we should embrace that illusion and we should go with that illusion. Even though it's not really true that for we have free will, we should just go with it because um, it allows for all these practically necessary things and that sort of thing. And Michael Shermer says that about Dan Barker in the introduction to the book, that Dan Barker has pretty well settled the issue about free will, settled all need for debate on free will or something like that. 
which means that Michael Shermer is endorsing this. That is an illusion that we should embrace. Well, what is an illusion but a pretense? Michael Shermer is saying we should pretend, right? So what are we pretending about? Well, okay, point number one, we're pretending about free will. We're pretending if atheism is true, atheistic naturalism, and we don't have free will because for reasons that we can't get into here, um, if God does not exist, it would seem that the universe is a closed system of cause and effect. And even if through quantum indeterminacy there is some way for it, it's really unlikely if there is no God that you have free will. And so most atheist naturalists who understand this don't believe in free will. But many of them will say, I'm a compatibilist, which is what Shermer and Dan Barker say, which is to say basically this, it's not real. But we're going to pretend that it's real because it helps us get through life. It's it makes us feel good. So we're going to just pretend. So it's not real. It's more like a Stepford situation. It looks real. It feels real. It seems real. But we know that under the hood or in the microchip, say, that we put in the Stepford wife, we know that it's not real. What we're seeing is not really real. But we need to pretend. We need it to look like a real wife. We need, we need it to be a Stepford thing. We need, we're going to pretend that it's real, even though it's really not real, uh, because that makes us feel good about the way the world is. So you have to pretend. Atheism means you have to play make-believe and you have to pretend about freedom. Secondly, you have to pretend and you have to play make-believe about rationality. Um, because, as we've said, if you don't have freedom, then when you're assessing which things you should should choose, you can't freely choose the things that you should affirm over against the things that you should not affirm. In fact, it's not just Christians that understand that. Um, let, let me share with you. John Searle um, says this. Actions are rationally assessable if and only if the actions are free. The reason for the connection is this. Rationality must be able to make a difference. Rationality is possible only where there are genuine, there is a genuine choice between various rational and irrational courses of action. If the act cannot be otherwise, then rationality can make no difference. It doesn't even come into play. That's from Rationality in Action, 2001, page 202. Um, he also says rationality is only possible where irrationality is possible, but the possibility of each requires freedom. So in order to behave rationally, I can do so only if I am free to make any of a number of possible choices and have the open possibility of behaving irrationally. When we perform conscious voluntary actions, we typically have a sense of alternative possibilities. Angus Manuge says rationality presupposes an entity with a libertarian freedom that can act on some reasons rather than others. That's from Philosophia Christi. Volume 15, number 1, 2013, page 95. Evan Fales says, The analysis of free choice, which I shall propose, derives in part from Aristotle's conception of practical reasoning. According to it, acting freely consists in acting as a result of rational deliberation over what act to perform. To choose is to deliberate. It is not to perform some superated act of will. The conception of freedom uh, makes obvious the connection between being free and having the capacity capacity to engage in rational deliberation. So the point is, as these men seem to understand, is that if you don't have freedom of the libertarian sort, where whatever you ended up doing, you could have done otherwise, then obviously freedom goes out the window, but also so does rationality. But of course, we still have to be able to say that we're rational. If, if you're an atheist, you must say that you're rational. After all, to juxtapose both of these issues in a way that is very awkward for the determinist atheist. The atheist wants to say they're a free thinker. But of course, freedom and being a free thinker go right out the window if atheism is true. And so because of that, uh, we have to pretend with freedom. That's number one. And then number two, we have to pretend and play make-believe when it comes to rationality. These are things that if you embrace an atheistic perspective, then you are just stuck. Whether you will affirm them, that's the consistent thing to affirm. And some atheists do affirm them. And that is a very awkward position. Whereas the Christian can say, no, the reason you feel free, you feel like you're free, and it seems almost impossible to doubt the notion that you're free, is because you actually are free. When you think that you could have done otherwise, it's because you could have done otherwise. When it comes to rationality, the reason you sense that you're making justified knowledge claims is because you really assessed different options and chose which one was the more reasonable, it's because that's what you really did. Rationality is a real thing. Justified knowledge claims are real things. But number one, atheists are in a position that if they're going to be consistent, they have to pretend that freedom is uh, real and they have to pretend that rationality is real. But it gets worse than that. Let's move on to the laws of logic. Do you believe the laws of logic exist? 
Well, okay, not without humans to describe them. Okay, let me so, ask you this then. Yeah, yeah. You're saying the laws of logic are just human constructions. Correct. Well, okay, okay two things. One, there is a reality that really exists, mm -hmm. so we can measure the, the angle here. You know, to, to a bat's brain, or you know, it may look different mm -hmm. than, than on my brain, but there really is a table. Right. Uh, and it really exists. Even if I can't ever know what it's like to be a bat and, and know what it feels like to experience a table through, through echolocation rather than touch or sight, uh, but still, that really exists. So the, the laws of nature that we describe and interpret with mathematics and words, um, those are human constructions. There's no like second law of thermodynamics or, or a, a Newtonian equation in a star a star is just doing what stars do. When they get a certain pressure and temperature, they convert hydrogen into helium. All right, let me, let, me, let me just ask yeah. you this. And you're saying yeah. the human constructions then. So let me ask you this. Before there were any human beings on the earth, was the statement, there are no human beings on the earth, true? <laughs> yes. Okay, well then how could the laws of logic just be human constructions then? <laughs> well, but we're, we're asking that today. Regardless of when if, we're if asking. If there's no humans, there's no one asking the question. But it was still true. Okay, before we go on, let me just say a couple of things about this that I really want you to get. So basically, Shermer is a materialist. He, he, so, so all that exists is nature and the material world. And so what uh, Frank Turek is now asking him is, look, what about the laws of logic? Aren't there laws of logic? And aren't those, I mean, you can't locate those in nature. Aren't those real things? And Shermer is saying, well, n well, not really. Those are constructs. Now, if they were just constructs, that would mean something like that we fabricated or made up the law of non-contradiction, that I can't at the same time be holding this cup in my hand and at the same time, in the same sense, not holding it in my hand. But of course, th that's impossible. So that we just made that up, that that's just a human construction. Um, and, and so uh, Frank Turek is, is, is really digging down here and he's saying, hold on a second. Uh, you're saying this is a construct, that there aren't really laws of logic like that. So those are things we made up, and they depend on our conscious experience, in other words, to think about them in order for them to somehow be real. But what about before humans ever existed on planet Earth? Were the laws of logic real then, or could contradictions and things like that happen? And Shermer seems to get very uncomfortable and says, well, um, I mean, there was no one there to think or ask that question. This is getting weird because he understands, I think, that if he were to grant that, yes, before there were humans to think about it, there were laws of logic, then this would strike against materialism, uh, perhaps, and perhaps mean that you need a conscious observer, namely God, in order to, to have these constructs be meaningful. And so this puts the naturalist in a very difficult place. Let's hear what he has to say. To that... How, how could you and I even communicate if you had your own idea of the laws of logic and I had my own idea? How could we even communicate well, unless we're... We, because there is a reality and we share a common neuroanatomy to describe it in ways that are similar. So this gets at the problem of other minds. Mm -hmm. How do I know your red looks like my red? Okay, these head scratchers that you get in philosophy 101. Uh, how do I know that you're not all a bunch of zombies and I'm the only one with the lights on? <laughs> okay. Okay, now I want you to notice, a careful listener will know, that really is a red herring. None of those things have anything to do with what we're actually talking about, except that we're talking about something that is philosophically complex. The answer to this is the Copernican principle, which says we're not special. You know, the, this, the Earth is not the center of the universe. You know, the, we go around the sun with all the other planets. We're not special. We're just in a little corner of the gal Milky Way galaxy, one of 100 billion galaxies. We're not special. Nobody's talking about that. The chances of me being the super special one human that's conscious and self-aware and the rest of you are zombies walking around and you only look like you're and, and pretending to be conscious we're not talking about it's very low so that that's how right but it, you're still not answering how these laws exist because they exist even if human beings don't exist mm -hmm. the laws exist no. in the mind of god okay. otherwise you and i couldn't even communicate okay no okay so first of all they exist in the mind the mind of god that that doesn't follow from this at all that's a separate assertion we can come back to that well, it is a somewhat of a separate assertion. It's kind of the second part to this whole thing, but that doesn't get you out of the tough spot you're in, Shermer. When we talk now, about now, a law... Minute, that, 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 what you just said there is an assertion, and you're using the laws of logic to say it. If the laws of logic aren't objective, that statement couldn't be true. First of all, okay, so back up. 
first of all, it, it's not true that there has to be a God or else. That, why would God make the laws any special? What, what's God got to do with the laws of nature? Nothing. You're just saying well, that. That's, well, that's the very point. The, I'm not talking about the laws of nature. I'm talking about the laws of logic. But if even, you want to talk so, about the laws so. of nature. Those are just words we're using, conventions, mathematical equations. Those are all human constructions. Michael, I know you're not a postmodernist. Please. They're just words. No, no, no. no they're they, describing they, they, truths. Yeah, but, okay. Yeah, but, okay. The equation, again, back I'm to, skeptical you're a postmodernist. To, say, say, <laughs> say Newtonian equations, they don't exist in the sun. The sun's just doing what the sun, it's just physical matter doing what it has to do. We Understand what's going on here is Shermer is in a spot where he, I'm not sure he knows exactly what he's actually saying. I don't mean that to sound offensive. I'm not sure he knows exactly where he's going with this. I, I, I think he only knows what he's trying to avoid saying <laughs> and what he's trying to avoid saying. I'm trying to be charitable here. I've, I've listened to a lot of Michael Shermer. I used to be a subscriber to Skeptic Magazine. Um, so And I admire him as a debater and all that sort of thing. But I, So I, it's not anything personal. Um, I'm just telling you what I think is going on here. He's try, he, All he knows is what he needs to avoid saying. And what he thinks he needs to avoid saying is that when humans were not on planet Earth, that the laws of logic were real because he needs everything to be physical and material and all that sort of thing. And, and not to depend on some ultimate consciousness or, or rule maker or anything like that. So, so, so here, what Frank Turek is saying is, look, when humans weren't here, the laws of logic were tr still true. And Shermer's trying to come back and say, um, no, I mean, there was stuff happening, but, but the laws of logic are just our own convention, which does sound very postmodern, like relativistic, like it's only true because we think it's true or something like that, which I don't really think is what Shermer wants to say. I think Shermer is stuck here in a spot where wherever he looks, whichever door he tries to go through, he ends up saying something that he knows he doesn't want to say. And so that's, I think that's why we're seeing what we're seeing describe it so before there were humans no there was no law. so the sun was not burning before there, there was were humans? no law of, no the sun of course is burning doing its thing but there's no law there's no newtonian equation to describe it well it, the, there's no newtonian equation to describe it in our minds because we're not here yet but that newtonian equation is still not the equation. describing the truth no, no, of what was happening no, no not the equation the, well the equation describes what happens the equation yes. doesn't do the work the equation is our way of of describing how it works correct okay but that that existed prior to you and me ever existing the sun was burning before you and i ever existed uh, okay i think we're, we're talking let about me move on to another things. question we're, well, okay. we're talking about two different things here we're talking about the material reality of stuff that exists and mm -hmm. then our description of it right well you you're you're, you're going with emergent pro uh, properties which appears to be a faith position <laughs> so yeah so i mean you, you're you're stuck this is one of those spots and in a debate Sometimes the audience might not see it, but for the person who understands how these debates are going and, and, and that sort of thing, Turk has got him now in a spot where no matter which way he goes, it's bad news. So, but the idea, the point is now we've got number one, if, if atheism is true and, and I'm using the sense of strong atheism, the belief that there is no God, um, if atheism is true, then guess what? Um, you can't have free will. Free, we pretend that free will. We need to pretend because in the words of Dan Barker, that is one of the most meaningful things about being a human being is free will, but it's not real. And so we have to pretend that it's real. It's an illusion. Remember, Shermer wrote the introduction to the book that's celebrating freedom as an illusion that we need to embrace. So free will, we have to pretend about that. We have to pretend, therefore, about rationality. We can't have justifiable knowledge claims and whatever we believe, we end up believing because we're determined to, but we need to pretend about that. So if atheism is true, we got to pretend about these two things. Lastly, thirdly, we got to pretend about the laws of logic. Um, we got to not, not necessarily pretend now, but when we look back to history before human beings existed on planet Earth, we have to pretend that uh, in order to talk meaningfully at all about those things, we have to pretend that the laws of logic were real then, but they weren't real because they're human constructs, um, whatever that may mean. But then it gets really worse when we get to the issue of morality. Um, and so we're going to take a look now at the question of morality. I took that sip so you'd see my new Trinity Radio coffee mug. Um, you can get all that Trinity Radio stuff at teespring.com. But anyway, let's uh, go on to hear what he has to say about morality. If God does not exist, only molecules exist, what is the nature of the moral standard called goodness and why are we obligated to obey it? What is that little ruler if it's not God's nature? Okay, back to where I started. Frank. Can you think of any reason why sexually molesting a child is bad? I can wrong, think of, evil. yes, I can think of reasons, but they're all based on moral principles which require God. No, they don't. 
Sure they no, do. No, really. Do you really need God to tell you and explain to you why it's wrong to molest no, a child? No, not to tell me why it's wrong, but you don't need God to know right and wrong. You don't need God to be good. You just need God to justify what no, good don't. is. Now, for anyone that's not initiated in this and hasn't studied these things, atheists often misunderstand and think that what we're saying is that Christians are going to be good and atheists are going to be bad. And that's the moral argument. Since Christians are good, therefore God exists. That's not the argument. And I don't think that's what Shermer understands him to, to think either. Uh, but the other misunderstanding that some people make is the only way we know how to be good is if we read the Bible and God tells us how to be good. That's the only reason we, that's the only way we know that murder is wrong. It's the only way we know that rape is wrong and all those sorts of things. That is also not the moral argument. In fact, the Bible teaches in Romans chapter two, verses 14 and following, I think it teaches that, um, that unbelievers have the law written on their hearts and, and are aware of these things. They're, 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 uh, their conscience uh, bearing witness against them when they do wrong things. So, um, so, so here's so here's this problem uh, the, of misunderstanding. But what we're actually saying is no. If there is no God, th this is the most simple man on the street sort of way to put it. If there is no God, then says who that torturing children for fun is wrong, or um, shooting up heroin is wrong, or murder is wrong? Says who? And then you get into this problem that we're about to see played out. Well. Um, our intuitions tell us that. Okay, but that's just your opinions. Okay, well, our, our, our society, our community, we make these laws and that tells us what's right and wrong. Okay, but that's just the opinions of your society. As I've said many times, right now, according to the opinions of the people that live in Evansville, Indiana, in general, according to our laws, you, it's wrong to buy and sell marijuana for recreational purposes where wrong means against the law. But you can get on a plane and you can go to Denver, Colorado, where you can buy and sell marijuana for recreational purposes, um, because according to their laws, it's not wrong. So it's still a matter of opinion based on the and you can still say says who so that if you were out in the middle of the ocean, um, you could say says who it's wrong to whatever thing I want to do. So if there is no God, you can keep kicking that can up the street, but ultimately just as a matter of opinion, either of one individual or a group of individuals or a nation of individuals or even all individuals on earth, but it's still a matter of opinion. It's not objectively wrong, which means it's a fact that it's wrong or that other things are right. Morality just becomes a matter of opinion. That's what he's hitting Shermer with here. And Shermer's having a hard time with it, I think, because he's trying to rely on our intuitions and say, well, the reason it's wrong is just because we just know it's wrong. You know, it's not we don't need God to tell us that it's wrong. But of course, again, that's to misunderstand. We don't think that you necessarily need God to know that certain things are right and wrong. What you need is God in order to ground the objective nature of those moral values and duties. No, what? Right there. Stop right there and mm -hmm. leave out the God part. I know why it's wrong. Full stop. You know the why reasons, it's wrong, but why is it wrong okay, so, independent of you knowing it? So Plato refuted this uh, two and a half millennia ago. It's called the Euthyphro problem or the Euthyphro dilemma. That is, um, if God says, say, murder is wrong, although technically by definition, that's what murder means, wrongful killing. Uh, it, but in any case, if, it, it, are there reasons why God is saying that? Yes, God has his reasons. Okay, give us the reasons. Made in the image of God. Okay, that's not the Euthyphro Dilemma. The Euthyphro Dilemma says you've got two, two options and neither one work for morality and God. On the one hand is does God arbitrarily decide based on what he likes what's right and wrong? Um, and, and then you have what's called philosophical voluntarism. So this is what Islam has, where um, if God makes a promise to you, and that's a good thing one day, and then tomorrow he decides that he doesn't, he wants to go back on that promise, um, then then he can do that because whatever he ends up doing just is good in that sense. Um, so that doesn't work. But then the other one of the youth for a dilemma is, um, is God appealing it's not that God orders or dictates that we do certain things just because that's what he likes, but there's something over and above God that he appeals to. These are these moral truths, and he commands those because, because they're true, independent of his preferences. Well, then there's something over and above God that God appeals to, and that doesn't work either because God's supposed to be the ultimate grounding of all these things. Uh, that's the youth for a dilemma. And the answer to it is, well, it springs forth from God's nature. God's nature is good. God neither appeals to something over and above himself. It comes from his nature. And at the same time, God doesn't arbitrarily decide these things. They spring forth from his good nature. And so that's the third way, as it's sometimes called. And so uh, just wanted to throw that in there since we didn't really get the youth for a dilemma, but he did mention it. Skip the middleman. All we need are the reasons why. 
But th- you see, that, that implies a moral principle. When you, like before you said, the reason you shouldn't sexually molest a child is because they're sentient beings and you wouldn't want them doing it to you or vice versa or whatever. Those are all other moral principles that need a source. What no, is the source, source on atheism? Uh, the source what is, is the no, standard? Not, leave atheism out of it. Atheism isn't anything. It's just lack of belief in God, full stop. Obligatory explanation of how he understands atheism. Uh, we could talk about civil rights, civil liberties, the, the rule of law. Where do rights uh, come conventions. from? Conventions. Okay, I think rights come from, the basis of it is human nature and what all of us want. Now, I think we're born with an inherent, innate sense of right and wrong. We know from research, like in Paul Bloom's lab at Yale, for example, with tiny infants. These are like six months to a year old babies. And they are shown uh, a little puppet show. So imagine there's this ramp. And this By the way, we Christians would agree with this because we think that God made us with this moral awareness written into, um, you could say, our neurons, written into our brains, written on our hearts, however you want to phrase that. Um, but, but we are aware of these things. Puppets pushing this ball up the ramp, and one puppet comes up and, and bashes the ball back down and is fighting the little the puppet. My, uh, and then, Michael, well, let me, me finish. Uh, this is a great experiment. Okay. I'm, I'm making an argument for I, I'm not disagreeing that we all know right from wrong. That's not my point. My point is not epistemology. How do you know right from wrong? My point is, what is rightness on an atheistic, materialistic worldview? See, because when you'll sometimes hear people say this, it's it's not epistemology, it's ontology. And epistemology has to do with, with your knowledge structure and how you know things. So often atheists will say, well, we know we, we have these moral things, we, we have these awarenesses because of uh, societal evolution or even biological evolution, but there's like this herd mentality where we know that it's not good for the group if I kill another member of the group or if I take his mate or whatever, whatever however you want to put it. Um, and, and okay, fine. That would explain how we came to be aware of moral truths. It would, that's the epistemology. It wouldn't explain the ontology. What are they? What is their grounding? And that is what Turek is pushing for. Humanist worldview, uh, right and wrong, is determined by a combination of our innate moral sense, our upbringing, what our parents teach us, our family, our social communities, and so on, which, by the way, have changed a lot. You guys would have been. Okay, I want you to really listen to this because what Shermer is going to lay out. Now, he's now the, the atheistic position has to be that there is no obje- I mean, you could have something like a, a, a non natural moral realism, but most of your atheists are going to take the position that um, it's subjective. Morality is subjective in the sense that there isn't some ultimate grounding. Now, sometimes they'll be tricky with language and say it's objective, but what they mean is something like we subjectively, like as a matter of opinion, decide on what we what what the goal of morality should be. And then there's objectively better or worse ways to get to that goal. So it's objective morality, understanding that that is can only be meant to to add a smokescreen and confuse and obfuscate what we're saying, because in this discussion at a higher academic level, the discussion is 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 when we say it's objective, we mean it's. It, that it's it's objectively things are objectively right and wrong in an ultimate sense um, and, or subjective a matter of opinion. Most atheists understand that in some sense it has to be subjective a matter of opinion, which means that outside of our own opinions, there isn't some ultimate standard that we are pressing toward. Um, that's why Frank Turek had the had the ruler between Hitler and Mother Teresa a while ago trying to say there is a standard. There has to be a standard because you talk about moral progress and regress and we see a difference between Hitler and Mother Teresa. What is that standard that we're appealing to? If not God, you've got you've got you, you, what is this progress progress toward what from what? I mean, there there isn't some objectively good thing that we're reaching toward. This is all a matter of opinion. So I want you to watch here where Shermer betrays himself a bit by describing a moral progress that cannot be ca- accounted for. In favor of burning witches and enslaving blacks centuries ago, you don't believe that anymore. Maybe 50 years ago, most of you would have voted, probably about 90% would have voted that Blacks and whites getting married should be illegal. It's not God's plan. God separated the races by continents. These were arguments made in the 20th century. Okay, my, nobody. My, in other words, can you believe how bad it was just in the 20th century? And I agree, but of course, I have a framework for a progress of our moral awareness and becoming more like what we should in certain respects. Uh, but but he's he's describing a progress. He continues. Here would argue that today, Michael. Your book, gay marriage. 
Most of you are probably against this. I, I contend probably half of you tonight are already uh, in favor of it or at least let it happen. In 10 years, we won't even be talking about gay marriage. Michael, why are any so of these right things... And wrong, right and wrong shifts over time, and it doesn't come from religion. Now, even notice he, with, his, with his hand motions, he, he gives you, it, it shifts like, a, like, like it's going up. Like it's, toward what? Clearly, he's trying to give us that there has been moral progress towards something better. It's better now. Our societal morality is better now than it once was. How can you say that? If 100 years ago, it included things you don't like now, but the people at the time did, and that was their moral structure, subjectively chosen, matter of opinion. Then they were just doing what they liked then, and you're doing what you like now, but you can't step out of the system and then say that now it's better than it was then. You can only say you like it more now because morality isn't really real in any objective sense. It's just a matter of opinion. Doesn't come from the Bible. There's no reinterpretation of when Paul said this, he really meant gays should get married. No, that's not how moral change happens. It's not happening through religion. I'm not talking about moral change. I'm talking about the grounding of morality. We if do we're that. just molecules, well then if we do it, then who's to say Hitler was worse than Mother Teresa? Again. Who's to say that, that, that if there's no standard beyond either of them, how can you say Hitler was wrong? Can you think of any reason why Hitler was worse than Mother Teresa? If you say because he killed people, then you just brought another moral principle in. It's wrong to kill people. About, Why is it wrong to kill people? How about the survival and flourishing of sentient beings is a good, and the more we promote that and do it. Says who? That's good. Harming Hit, and Hitler killing says, people is Michael, bad. Michael, Hitler Therefore. says no. Hitler wants to flourish his sentient beings, not you. Yes, Why okay, is he wrong? So, so He was wrong because it's going, violating the sense that every autonomous person has of a desire to live and fulfill their destiny as why is that why is that a good thing or principle we ought to obey we're yeah. born with it we're born we knowing it but why should we obey it we get it from like for example our constitutions that we write and we say this ah, you see this is what i said this is how it goes well it's it's either a matter of opinion of an individual person or of a group of people or whatever and now he's going to a nation of people um we can write a constitution and then it becomes meaningful that way what we're going to do and we're going to so if we write a constitution that says gay marriage is bad you're for that no 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 uh oh okay so there's a standard outside the constitution you want to impose on it yeah, see, I mean, th this is the problem. You're Again, we've got a spot where you got one of two doors to go through, Shermer. And either one he opens, there's a boogeyman. <laughs> either way he tries to go, it's not good. So here we're, we we, we got to figure this out. Um, is it a matter, is, 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 it, is it based on a matter of opinion or is it ultimate? It can't be ultimate if it's you're basing it on a group, an individual, a nation, or even everybody in the world. It just becomes a matter of opinion. Um, the two plus two equals four is objectively true mathematically. And it wouldn't matter if everyone on earth thought that two plus two equaled 10. They'd just all be wrong and it would still equal four. And if you're going to say that morality is, is uh, objective or meaningful in some sense like that, objective, then if everyone on earth thought that it was okay to torture children for the fun of it, they'd just all be wrong and it would still be wrong. So you, you, you've got this real bad situation here if you're Michael Shermer. What ultimately does he have to say? Ultimately what he has to say is it's pretend. There is no ultimate real morality, but we pretend that morality is real because if we don't pretend that, what would the world look like? And this gets much more explicit if you listen to the backyard discussion between cosmic skeptic and rationality rules where they're discussing free will. Uh, I applaud them that aside from the issue of rationality, I don't think they buy that or see. I don't, I don't know if they've I don't know if they've bought into that or thought much about it, but they recognize that free will is an illusion and it's just not real. There is no free will. And they're not going to go with the pretense. Now, I do think they have to pretend in, in terms of how they live their lives. But at least intellectually, they're trying to be consistent and say, no, f there is no free will. You people that are compatibilists, no, you don't do that. It's j They're more the Sam Harris route. It, there just is no free will. And um, ultimately, that means that when a man kills a family, murders them, he ultimately wasn't responsible. We're going to hold him responsible because we have to, but but he's not ultimately responsible. But here with, but and the, even there, you're kind of pretending, right? I mean, you're having to pretend that he's responsible when he's not responsible because he was determined to do whatever he did. But here, what we have is the recognition 
um, by some atheists, but not really by Michael Shermer, that, yeah, we have to pretend that freedom is real. We have to pretend that rationality is real. We have to pretend, though we won't admit this, that when we look at the ancient past before human beings existed, that, um, that the laws of logic were real. We have to pretend that. And now we have to pretend about morality. It's not really real in the objective sense. It's just made up. It's make-believe. It's pretend. But it's useful, and it makes us feel good, so we're going to do it. That's just pretend. That's all. Do you see all the things you have to pretend? And, and get get this. It's not things you have to pretend are real, just uh, that are not that important. These are some of the things that you most intuitively know are real, that are the most important things about life. And if atheism is true, you have to pretend with all of them. You have to pretend. It's make-believe. That is so shocking. Now, that's really the point, but there's one more thing about abortion that I want you to hear here because, number one, it was just such a, a great debate moment, but it also allows us to talk about something a little bit interesting here that I don't normally talk about when, when abortion comes up. So here's, here's this great moment. Based on our nature, yes, it's, it comes inherent with the species. We're born with a sense of a desire for life, freedom, and autonomy, which is why women have been fighting against the church for 2,000 years to have reproductive rights, freedom from oppression, from uh, males and so forth. And we have all been bending to this because women say, that's what we want. Unless it's, it's something we want because we're born with Unless it. the woman is in the womb. Okay, now let's, let's talk all about right. that for a whoa, second. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Let me go to a new subject, that, that, Michael. That, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. No, no, you it's brought it up. It's my time, Michael. You brought it up. Oh, man. I should, I, and here maybe. Would it be immoral of, for me to stop you? <laughs> yeah. It, it might be a good time to. Uh... I think, look, look, Shermer's had some good debates, but, but honestly, as a debater myself, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, he cannot feel good right now. Now he doesn't have the home court advantage, right? Like I think these are, I think this is in a church and these are Christians, but, but, but I mean, this has just not been going well. And in one sense, it's just because of Frank Turek's magnificent rhetorical ability and that he knows these issues really, really well. Uh, he's thought about, as a good debater should, he's thought about every way that Shermer can go. That's why it looks like Shermer's getting a door slammed in his face every time he tries to take a new path. But, um, but you can't think this is going well right now. I mean, this is rough right here. Use Bill Maher's line that Republicans are pro-choice all the way up to the time where their mistress gets pregnant. Yeah, offend the audience. That's what you want to do. You're backed into a corner. What can I do? Well, the audience is still with me. Let me, let me offend all of them. And also, uh, conservatives seem to be uh, pro-life all the way up until birth. And then after that, just war. It's perfectly okay to kill innocent civilians in Iraq. It's perfectly okay to put to death uh, people on death row. You've already argued that it's justifiable to kill certain people, even innocent people, due to some other cause. All right? So you, we're already on the same page no, there. No, 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 Michael, what you just brought up, there's a difference between an innocent child in the womb and a guilty murderer on what death row. What about an innocent civilian in Iraq that we bomb using we drones? Try, that's why we try and minimize and those, we, because we, we know that person's damage. valuable. Well, okay. Let me go on to final question. Only got... Okay, so, so that, that's the end of the clips that I'm going to play, but, but let's talk about this for just a minute, because he makes a point that comes up a lot in pro-life discussions and things like that. So, uh, on the one hand... Um, Th that's absolutely true about women's rights and all that. It's women's rights so long as it's not females in the womb. And 100% of born... I'm sorry, I know this is a cliche. It's a darn good cliche. 100% of people alive right now would not have wanted to be aborted. And I guarantee you that the people that, that, uh, that, that have been aborted, if they got to live, they would have, been, they would have not chosen to be aborted, right? So, I mean, th this is... This is Abortion is the most wicked thing that we do as a society today. In fact, I'll just say it. Um, uh, just the other day, I saw um, Randall Rouser, who I think is a, is a good debater. I agree with him on many, many things. I disagree with him on some things. I've covered a debate or two that he's been in, um, and, and I, I, I respect him. But he put something out that said something like, we cannot continue to talk about or think about abortion as murder. I think he said talk about abortion as murder if we're going to get an intellectual hearing or something like that. Okay, now listen to me, Internet. I understand what, what we're trying to say there because— for the young woman who goes to have an abortion, who perhaps hasn't thought about all these things at a philosophically deep level, she may not 
in her mind, she's not intentionally committing murder. She's not thinking about, I'm going to murder this, this baby. She's, she's thinking, okay, I've been told that this is, you know, that this is a, an acceptable procedure and all that. Now the doctors in the, or the people in the clinic that are carrying out the abortion. <clears throat> yeah. I think they know enough to know that what they're doing is morally reprehensible and should be put to an end. Um, but, uh, but to say that we shouldn't talk about it with the most stark terms is not to raise the bar intellectually because look, either it is the taking of innocent human life that is a person or not. If it is then, and this may be offensive, but when we talk about the Holocaust of the Jews, you're talking about the taking of innocent lives who were persons made in the image of God. And with abortion, you're talking about the taking of innocent lives who are persons made in the image of God. And if and, and you, no one would ever say about a particular candidate, not that I'm telling you who to vote for. And <laughs> right now it's tough. I get it. But no one would say, um, well, you know, uh, this particular individual is in favor of killing 6 million Jews, but let's not talk about that as, as that kind of killing and murder, because that it doesn't sound intellectual and we're not going to get a hearing. And after all, they have some other policies that are great. We don't want to be one issue voters. No, I'm sorry. If that's one of the things that they stand for, I, they shouldn't even be on the ticket and I can't take it seriously because this is wicked. This is horrific. This is why I don't understand when Christians say, well, I'm, I'm pro-life, but I can't tell someone else what they should do. Well, listen, I'm not telling you to take up arms or anything like that. I'm telling you to vote appropriately, and I'm telling you to um, try to witness to people and change hearts and minds. But at the same time, let me tell you something. Would you say something like, you know, I don't think it's good to murder an 18 year old man, but I can't tell anyone else what they should do. This betrays that you really aren't thinking about this the way that you say you are, which is that abortion is the taking of innocent humans lives that are persons. And that is a very, very important issue. So when we're talking about it in terms of politics and, and at this level, no, 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 this, this is serious enough that, um, whoever's guilty of murder or not, this is the taking of innocent life unjustly, and these innocent lives are persons. All right, so so I I take no prisoners when it comes to this. I don't care if you're if you're a skeptic out there or a liberal Christian and you think that I'm off the rails on this. You're just gonna have to think that because I think you're off the rails. I think anyone who is pro-choice in the sense that we're talking about here is is off the rails. Now you may. You may be a person who's had an abortion and there's love and there's forgiveness and that is all true. And listen, God can forgive that. And it may be that you weren't completely aware of all of the details and positions and important philosophical issues that come up with this. So I understand that there, it's not that you're some monster, but it is that this issue, it represents something that is monstrous. And I don't, I don't back down from that at all now. Um, but it's interesting here. This comes up and he raises an, an issue. And, and by the way, I have other videos on abortion that, that make my case uh, against uh, the pro-choice situation. But, but it's interesting here that he says, as just kind of a, a shot across the bow at conservatives, uh, as conservative Christians, that you guys are pro-life until the baby is born and then you're not pro-life anymore. A couple of things. And then you talk about just wars and capital punishment. OK, let's talk about these things in, in two, two sections here. On, on the one hand, when it comes to um, we're pro-life until the baby is out of the womb and then we're not pro-life. OK, we're going to talk about that in a moment. But let's just say you're absolutely right. Let's say we are all horrible jerks, wicked, wicked, awful people. And once people are born, we're completely against helping them at all. And, and all of that were true. If that were true, does that still make it okay to kill innocent lives in the womb? Does that make pro-life a bad thing when, uh, when, when it's in the womb? Just because it's also bad to do that outside of the womb? This is the, this is terrible. This is some kind of weird, distorted um, tu quo qui fallacy that needs to be done away with. Secondly, um, what are you talking about? Conservative Christians give a lot of money and a lot of uh, aid and support to try and help um, widows and orphans and, and people in developing world countries. Tons and tons and tons of money. I mean, have you read the studies or is this just some kind of happy party line? Um, I mean, here, here's the thing about this. I will admit, here's where I'll admit uh, something, not admit that he's right, admit a conflict in my own thinking uh, in this realm of my worldview. 
I am going to shock some people here, but I am not in favor of capital punishment. Now, I understand that while it is unjust to take an innocent life in the womb, that that is a reversal of justice. On the other hand, to take a murderer who killed some woman's son and he's on death row and now rather than letting him, you know, have life for life justice, we are actually going to force that mother of that child to pay along with all the other taxpayers to keep this this horrible human being alive. I, I get that that is a reversal of justice as well. But I'm not in favor of capital punishment, partly because there have been cases where it, it, we, an innocent person has been put to death and also because we're not consistent in how we dole that out. So it's more of a practical thing, but I'm not in favor of capital punishment. Don't want capital punishment for these reasons. And I know a lot of my conservative Christian followers are going to disagree with me on that. Sorry, I'm not a, I'm not in favor of it. Now, when it comes to war, I, also my conservative Christian fans are not going to not that I should have fans, but are not going to like this either necessarily. And this is where there's a little bit of an inconsistency or conflict in my worldview where I need to do some theoretical accommodation and figure this out. But I've thought about it for a long time. I don't quite know what to do. On the one hand, you cannot, I don't think you can consistently point to Old Testament war stuff and say that because there was war that God sanctioned in the Old Testament that he ordered Moses and Joshua to carry out, that that somehow means that it's now um, it's justified for us to engage in combat. There were a couple of relevant differences. With Moses and Joshua, they had first person direct knowledge from God verbally what they were supposed to do. Okay, that, that was it was very clear and it was from God. I don't think any king or president today or war general has that kind of direct um, audible confirmation from God of what God wants. Okay, so they can say they prayed about it and I don't deny that some of them did, but they do not have what Moses and Joshua had, which is like as close to Cartesian certainty as you can have about what God wants you to do. That's important. Second, I think it's also important that when Joshua went in and, and they attacked the people in Canaan. Not only did they know for sure this is what God wanted them to do, the God who created the universe, the ultimate judge and the ultimate standard of justice, that's what he wanted them to do. But on top of that, they knew that everyone on this side of the battlefield was a believer who was carrying out what God wanted. And everyone on that side of the battlefield was an unbeliever who was a pagan idolater and who had had... 400 years, their culture had had 400 years to repent and, and uh, trust in the one true God. So they were ripe for judgment and God was using them. So, so these, but now what do you have? You have situations where with any particular war, we don't know for sure what God would have us do. And you could have a Christian sitting next to a Satanist in a foxhole firing across the battlefield at other brothers in Christ or sisters in Christ or unbelievers that might have come to Christ. So this whole thing is so confused. So in a sense, I'm a bit pacifistic in principle. On the other hand, I realize that the military has at times necessarily stepped in when dictators, I mean, does anybody disagree? I mean, maybe I'm sure there are people that think that we shouldn't have gotten involved in the, with the Holocaust was happening and put that to an end. And so it's a very tough, it's a ve plus also I am the beneficiary of a nation of war. So I, I admit that this is a tough issue, but the point is, no, <laughs> Shermer's wrong. It's not that we're, oh, we're so pro-life in the womb and then we're not pro-life afterwards. No, a consistent Christian is pro-life all the way through. But Turek is right. Wherever you think about war and capital punishment, Turek is right to point out that there's a difference between an unborn child that's innocent in insofar as anyone's innocent and then uh, a person who committed a crime um, or who is a casualty of war in, in a sense like that. There are relevant differences and Shermer is trying to use a bumper sticker way of, of trying to shoot this down. So anyway, I've come to the end now. And what I really want to say about all of this is this, this gives you, it's all pretend. We pretend about freedom. We pretend about rationality. We pretend about the laws of logic. We pretend about morality. We pretend the most meaningful things in life. And, and if atheism is the case, you have to just pretend. And that makes, that results in what I think we could call Stepford atheism. Again, 
with Stepford Wives. With real wives, there are a lot of really great things that you love about them and enjoy. They provide real love, real companionship, an opportunity for you to grow as a person by sacrificing yourself for the good of another. But there are a lot of things, speaking as a 1950 stereotypical man, there are a lot of things you don't like. Real wives come with responsibility. They expect things from you. They don't always see it your way. They can be demanding. They are not okay with your being unfaithful. With Stepford Wives, those things you don't like are gone. Unfortunately, so is their real love and real freedom and real reasoning. The meaning has been stripped from them, and with it, what makes romance worth it to begin with. Likewise, with God, there are a lot of really great things that everyone would like about God. Um, we, he provides real love, real companionship, real purpose, and opportunity for real sacrifice. But there are things that some people don't like about God. God comes with responsibility. He expects things from you. He doesn't always see it your way. He can be demanding, and he is not okay with your being unfaithful. With atheistic naturalism, like with Stepford Wives, those things you don't like are gone. Unfortunately, so is real love, real freedom, and real reasoning. The meaning has been stripped from reality, and with it, what makes life worth it to begin with. And like the Stepford husbands, you come to find out it's not just others that have no freedom, morality, reasoning, and so on and so forth. You are likewise a moist robot carrying out a pretend existence. To be a thoroughgoing atheist is to be a citizen, a true citizen of Stepford. It is to play make-believe. It is pretend. And with that, I'll see you next time on Trinity Radio.